Okay, Proverbs chapter, Proverbs chapter 14, and also 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 as well. So, uh, Proverbs chapter 14, and the Bible says this here. It says, um, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is reproached to any people. Righteousness exalted the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. A reproach is a disgrace. It's something that brings you down. Uh, righteousness exalts. Sin will bring you down. Look at uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 7. This is a verse that uh, has been used many a time to preach a revival sermon. And this is written to Israel as a nation, but we're going to read it. Um, and we're going to apply it in principle to us in the New Testament. If my people, God's speaking here, if my people, well, who is God's people? Here in the context, it is Israel, his chosen people. In the New Testament, uh, it would be applicable to the church, to New Testament Christians. If my people, which are called by my name, and we're called by the name of uh, Jesus Christ, Jehovah saves, if they'll humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So that's a great text. That's a great verse, a great truth there, a great principle. Um, but in the day when it was written, it was written to a nation that was uh, all assimilated pretty much and on the same page with God. And um, it was God's people and it wasn't, you know, a hundred denominations they were split up into. They were one nation and one religion. In America today, the problem is that we have a lot of Christian churches, so-called in, in uh, quotation marks, that aren't really Christian churches, aren't really preaching the gospel. Um, and what they need to do is they need to get saved, a lot of them. But if we're talking about when Peter writes and says that uh, judgment must begin at the house of God, and he's talking about the church of God. It has to start with the church of God. The church of God is everybody saved uh, in the universal body of Christ. Uh, but if we're going to get right, that's never going to happen. Uh, in, the, in these last days, I believe that the only thing that's going to happen is that local churches can get a hold of this and the members of that church get right and that church pretty much get right. But there's no church that represents America that's going to get right with God and America's going to bless America because some big church got right with God. Uh, if Joel Osteen's church got right with God tomorrow, it really wouldn't make much of a difference. Maybe it would make a difference if they preach the gospel. But as far as God turning his judgment away from America, it's going to require more than that. And he's talking to his people. Uh, you think about, you look at Nineveh, back in the book of Jonah. Uh, those were lost people. And God sent Jonah there with a message, and the message was that you need to uh, repent and turn from your wicked ways. I take it back. He said he didn't even say that. What he said was, he said, I, I retract that. I don't think he even said that. All he said was, judgment's coming. In 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. That's all he said. That's all it's recorded. His sermon was, judgment's coming, period. What we do about it? Judgment's coming. Jonah doesn't record anything beyond that. But those people in chapter 3, they did turn from their wicked ways. They did repent. They did turn back to God. They did get right with God, which indicates to me that they took on Jehovah as their God. In an Old Testament sense, they got saved. And what happened was is God spared Nineveh for at least another 100 years before he judged them because they all got right. So a nation can get right with God, get saved, um, and turn things around. But um, this here is not talking about people getting saved. It's talking about God's people getting right. So in any case, just with that introduction there, talking about nations and what the Bible says about them, righteousness exalts a nation. So America should seek righteousness. If they did, God would exalt them. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. So if our president, as the representative and the leader of our nation, and that's whom God looks at uh, to see where we stand. If he was to get right, if he was to get saved and tell the whole world and then turn back to the Bible and things like that, you know what would happen? There would be a change in America. Amen. 
and God uh, would change his, and he would, might repent of the evil that he has, uh, you know, planned to judge America with. That's how the Old Testament works, and I believe the principles there in the New Testament as well. But in any case, we're going to talk today about uh, the decline and decay of America, our nation that we love. The decline and decay of America. Uh, we've read the two verses that are the foundation of this message. Let me just start by saying this. America was founded uh, upon the principle of religious freedom. There's no question about that. Uh, there were those who came for the purpose of financial gain and commercial enterprise, and they did exploit uh, those who were here before them. But primarily, this nation was founded by Christians and upon Christian principles. Uh, the first real independent Americans were the Pilgrim Fathers who sailed on the Mayflower. And they landed at Plymouth Rock in 1620. They were known as dissenters, brownists, and separatists. We would know them today as Baptists. They were God-fearing, Bible-believing Christians. They were led by their pastor, John Robinson, and later, after he passed, uh, William Brewster. Uh, while they were off the coast of Massachusetts, November 11, 1620, which is uh, why we celebrate Thanksgiving now, but November 11, 1620, off the coast of Massachusetts, they established what's called the Mayflower Compact. Uh, this document was the first constitution of any kind in America as to oppose to a British charter. William Bradford was voted by his peers to be the governor of Plymouth Colony, and this was the first free election on American soil. The people there elected their own representative and ruler as their governor. So the first free election, the first constitution of any kind that ever occurred on American soil occurred in 1620 at Plymouth Rock, if you will. Now, the Mayflower Compact, compact uh, which was the first constitution, said in part this, In the name of God, amen, having undertaken for the glory of God. What they undertook was to leave England and religious persecution and come to America for religious freedom. That's what they were looking for. And so they said, having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. Wow. They said they came to America to do what? To glorify God and advance the Christian faith. That's what they said they did. Uh, and to also honor our king and country. That time it would have been England and the king. So they want to honor the king. They want to honor their country. And they want to bring the Christian faith to America. And so they said a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. Uh, they, they missed it because of the weather. Do by these present solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and of one another covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and the furtherance of the ends aforesaid. They established a government so they could advance the Christian faith. So it was founded by Christians upon Christian principles. A century and a half later, the colonies broke away from England. They declared their independence on July 4th, 1776. This was the day the Declaration of Independence was signed by men who pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor in the cause of freedom. Uh, take it back, it was actually signed a day or two before that, but it was publicly read and acknowledged on the July 4th. But they said they pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor in the cause of freedom, and many of them did exactly that. Thomas Jefferson said at the time that two-thirds of the population was composed of what's called dissenters, which, again, is another term for Baptist. They were known for their love of freedom and their hatred of the religious establishment and the state churches in the colonies. So he said the Baptists were the ones who loved freedom and hated religious establishments, organized religion. Uh, we've come a long way from what the pilgrims and uh, uh, founding fathers envisioned and established. Uh, righteousness once exalted our nation, but sin is now bringing reproach, shame, and disgrace on this country. Um, back in 1980, the Supreme Court ruled that the Ten Commandments could no longer be posted in the public schools. Louisiana is getting ready to start posting them again. Amen. Um, when I wrote this message uh, and, and worked up this sermon years ago, it was in 2002, I think, and uh, in 2002, just a over 20 years ago, uh, around July 4th of that year, uh, George Bush was the president at the time. A federal judge ruled in favor of the ACLU and against a Cleveland judge who displayed the Ten Commandments in his court and said he couldn't do it anymore. Uh, a high school valedictorian in Charleston, West Virginia, 
was refused the chance to lead in prayer at his graduation. And so instead of him leading in prayer, the 1,000 students that were assembled there for the graduation decided in unison on their own to start quoting the Lord's Prayer in protest. Yep. Um, two country singers were told that their lyrical content was inappropriate at ABC and PBS for their 4th of July celebration. What was wrong with it? Were they exalting alcohol and drugs and immorality and using curse words? No, their songs were pro-American and patriotic and they thought it was too much. Um, and the Ninth Circuit Court out of San Francisco ruled the Pledge of Allegiance was unconstitutional. And so they forbid nine states in the West from repeating and reciting the, the, the Pledge of Allegiance in public classrooms. So we've come a long way from the Founding Fathers, amen? Um, and that was 20 years ago. And what's going on today? So I want to talk today about seven things I believe that uh, are corrupting America and contributing to the decline and the decay of America. And uh, people have been preaching this sermon, this outline for years. And you know what? It just gets worse every year. It gets worse every decade. When we, look, we think it's bad now, wait till 10 years from now I preach this sermon again. What's it going to be like? But in any case, let me say this. What's some of the contributing factors to the decline of America? Well, number one is politics without principle. Politics without principle. A principle is a foundational belief or a rule of conduct that determines your decisions in life. A one who has principle will do what he does based on what he believes is the right thing to do. Uh, he'll not compromise his convictions. It's been said that men hold, hold opinions, but convictions are what hold men. And convictions are what I call predetermined decisions. They're not preferential choices made at the at the, in the heat of the moment. America once had statesmen, whereas now she's only got professional politicians. Uh, politicians without principle uh, is a cheap opportunism that's uh, it, it's fueled by ambition and avarice. And that's what I got from Benjamin Franklin. He said that. Uh, ben Franklin said to beware of men that are ambitious and have avarice. What does that mean? That means they're power hungry and they're money hungry. Right. You better be careful of those people. They're going to ruin your, ruin your government, ruin your country. Amen? Politics without principle. Uh, Herbert Hoover said this, when there's a lack of honor in government, the morals of the people are poisoned. That's back in 1930-something. Uh, Proverbs says that a gift blinded the eyes. That is bribery. Uh, you can bribe people to do things. You can, uh, the, the, the lobbyists take them out to dinner. They wine and dine them, amen. And, uh, and they pay for their meals and they give them gifts and this and that and whatever. Actually, within the government, it may be so in a lot of private sector, but in the government, uh, you can't give your manager a gift that's worth over more than $10. And then only on a, on a special occasion. Because, why? Because they don't want you to be influencing people in power. Um, Napoleon said, I'm sorry, King David quoted God himself where he said this, He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. So God says if you're going to be a ruler over other men, you have to be just, fair, righteous, and ruling in the fear of God. Uh, in the uh, state of Tennessee, the Constitution, I believe, still says this, that a gospel minister cannot run for office. You know why? Because the people that wrote that Constitution, wherever they did it, felt that the gospel call was a higher call than serving in government. And they didn't want people, gospel ministers wasting their time in government when they should be preaching the Word of God. That's what the Tennessee Constitution says. Um, it also says this, that you can't hold office if you don't believe and a supreme deity and an afterlife. If you don't believe in God and heaven and hell, according to the Constitution, you can't run and hold an office in Tennessee. That's the state constitution. You say, what about separation of church and state? That applies to the federal government, not state governments. Uh, so anyway, uh, Patrick Henry, the governor of Virginia, said this back in the, during the revolution. He said, they, uh, first of all, who would rule us must be Christians. Only vote for Christians. Uh, Napoleon said, I've seen men without God. You cannot rule them, you shoot them. Robert Winthrop, uh, Winthrop, Speaker of the House at one time back in that day, said, Men, in a word, must necessarily be controlled either by a power within them, that's principle, or a power without them, that'd be government, either by the Word of God, the Bible, or by the strong arm of man, either by the Bible 
or by the bayonet. Right. That was during the revolution. He said that. Uh, today we see politicians invoke the name of God and Jesus Christ and then position themselves completely against the word of God on moral and social issues such as abortion, capital punishment, gay marriage, sex perversion, and so on. Uh, America, by the way, is a constitutional republic where an elected officials are entrusted with making good decisions. Yet many times they make bad ones because they are in the pockets of big money interests or they're afraid to take a moral stand and be ridiculed by the media and lose votes. Uh, George Washington, first in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen, amen. The father of our country said this, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are the indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness. He said, if you try to subvert and undermine religion and morality in America, you are an enemy of America. That's what he said. He believed that the national morality based upon religious principle was the foundation of American liberty and prosperity and he stated that by religion that he meant the Protestant faith. He said that. Not the Catholic faith, the Protestant faith. Uh, he also said it's impossible to rightly govern without God or the Bible. That's George Washington. No wonder they hate him. Amen. John, Will, John Adams, our second president, said this, We have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. And that's what's going on now. Uh, we have a country that kids are being raised without religion, without morality, and you can't bridle their passions. And that's why we got so much crime and broken homes and things like that going in America, and it's going to continue. Um... He said, we have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. He said, religion and morality is what the Constitution is written for. People that are religious and moral. It's not written for anybody else. And George Washington said, without religion and morality, you're subverting the nation. Uh, James Madison wrote this. He was the, I believe, the, not the president, but he had something to do with the, with the Constitution. I guess he was, I think he was the president of that convention. I can't remember. But James Madison said this. Ma Madison, I believe, is called the father of the Constitution. That's what I'm trying to think. He's the father of the Constitution. He wrote this. He said, we have staked the whole future of American civilization, not upon the power of government, far from it. We have staked the future of all our political institutions upon the capacity of mankind for self-government, upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves, to control ourselves, to sustain ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. That's Washington, Jefferson, Adams, Madison. They all said things like this. And so America, even though the Constitution doesn't say anything about God, the Declaration says a few things about him, yet you read their writings and they all said that religion and morality and Christianity were necessary to the governance of America and the survival of it. So I say this, one reason America is declining is politics without principle. And then there's pleasure without morality. Pleasure without morality. The Bible said in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that in the last days men shall be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. So we live in a hedonistic society based on a playboy philosophy that if it feels good, do it. Amen? That was the 1960s mantra. Just do what you want to. Do your thing, man. If, it, if, you, if you like it, it makes you feel good, do it. Whatever it might be. Uh, by the way, most people don't consider what's right and what's wrong, and they don't consider what the Bible has to say about it. Nothing wrong with having a good time uh, as long as it isn't sinful, by the way. You can have all the, all the good times you want, all the fun times you want, and just as long as you don't commit sin while you're doing it. Did you know that you can have a lot of fun without getting in, indulging in sin? A lot of people can do that. Amen? You don't have to have alcohol and drugs and all that stuff to have fun. Um, Christians ought to have a, a sanctified fun, but not indulge in sinful pleasures. Uh, Moses chose to suffer with the people of God rather, to the, rather, rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, it says. Uh, you take the world it promotes, it encourages sin. 
It encourages illicit sex, abortion, drunkenness, and so on. Uh, unwed mothers uh, in America used to be a shame, and now they have their own section of the high school yearbook where they're celebrating the birth of their child in an unwed situation. Um, today, uh, I, I assume these figures still hold true if they're not more, one-third of all babies are born out of wedlock. One-third of all babies are born out of wedlock. Uh, that's what's the problem, is the family has fallen apart. Um, when you play around with sin, and that's what people do, you're skating on thin ice, and you're going to be in hot water before it's over with, amen? Sin's going to sting you, it's going to burn you, it's going to bite you. It's going to, it's, your, your sin will find you out. And pleasure without morality is bringing down America. There's no self-control. There's no temperance being exercised. Um, one time I, read, I heard this story before and I read it uh, down Laredo, Texas on the border there was a man in a wheelchair he was giving out free pencils and on that pencil it had Romans 6.23 the wage of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life and as you give out the pen to people walking through there it was a rowdy town Laredo a border town and uh, a lot of uh, CD characters and a lot of uh, uh, illicit things going on there and he got involved in it once, and it cost him, and he's in a wheelchair because of it. So now he got saved, and he's got a pen that says Romans 6, 23 on it, and he says this to many people as they walk by. He would say, one night across the border, one night with a Mexican prostitute, and I've been in this chair for 20 years. It's not worth it. His message was, determined to live clean and live for Christ. Because sin has its wages. And sin will find you out, and sin will curse you. Amen? Curse this way, this man, this way. It curses many people in different ways. But it's no fun. Sin is not fun. Amen? The Bible said that fool, fools make a mock at sin. What does that mean? That means they mock at it. They make a mockery of it. That's what a lot, that's what all these comedians do today. You know, they're just mocking sin. They're making a mockery of sin. Uh, of, uh, of the Bible and what it has to say about morality and religion and these things. So pleasure without morality is bringing America down. We live in a drunken nation. It's a drunken nation. I don't know how many drunks we got in America, but people are just drinking and doing drugs all the time, and they're like zombies, many of them. And uh, it's just a pitiful thing for them personally and their families, but it brings the nation down. Not only that, but uh, knowledge without character brings about the decline of a nation. Knowledge without character. Uh, President Teddy Roosevelt said to educate a man in mind, but not in morals, is to create a menace to society. Where's these, where's these words? Who's, who's saying this today? We don't hear many people saying that. And if they do say that, they're being ridiculed and mocked, as I said earlier. Amen? Uh, the Bible says knowledge puffeth up, but charity edify. Knowledge will give you a big head. Knowledge will make you proud and egotistical. But charity edifies. Uh, educated men can be some of the most wicked people in the world. Uh, one prime example, look at the Nazis. Highly educated people. Intelligent people. Believed in science. Um, just because you're smart doesn't mean that you're a good person. And that you can't do stupid things. Amen? And sinful things. Uh, an uneducated man might use a gun to rob you. An educated man will use his brain to steal your retirement. They're both crooks. Um, a little knowledge is dangerous for some people, and a lot of knowledge can be more dangerous. Uh, that's why the Bible says uh, that you ought to uh, avoid that which is evil, be simple to that which is evil, and uh, how does he say it? Um, Romans chapter 16, that verse, be, he, said be, he said be simple concerning evil and wise concerning that which is good. Be wise concerning that which is good. Be simple concerning that which is evil. So don't study evil. You'll learn too much and it might affect you. Bob Jones Sr. said this. He said education without salvation is damnation. And that's a fact. That's true. Uh, knowledge may be gotten from the library. But character can only be gotten by a life that has been exercised and doing right no matter what the cost. Again, knowledge like character brings around a decline in the nation. Character is something that can be instilled in a person. That's what home's for. That's what school's for. 
That's what work does. That's what the military does. You know what they do? They instill discipline in the person. At least they're supposed to. And if you don't instill discipline in your children when they're young, the teacher's going to have a difficult time instilling discipline in the, in the classroom. And then outside of the classroom, the, the workplace is going to have a hard time finding people that they can hire to do the job. And the military is looking for good people. They're having a hard time finding good people. Why? Because people are not, uh, they have no character. Um, character is what makes you stand by your principles and live by your convictions. And so character does count. It is a meaningful thing. Noel Webster, who wrote the English Dictionary, said this, The Christian religion is the most important and one of the first things in which all children under a free government ought to be instructed. Here's the man who wrote the 1828 Dictionary. Noel Webster, famous for that. It's called the Webster's Dictionary. You, you, you got, they, they use it to this day, not the 1828 we do, I use it, but the Webster Dictionary is all over the place. It's in every college, in every classroom in America uh, because of him. He said the Christian religion is the most important and one of the first things in which all children under a free government ought to be instructed. Well, I guess by that uh, criteria, we're not under a free government anymore. He said under a free government, Christianity should be taught to all children. You can't do that in America today. You know why? Because according to Noah Webster, we're not under a free government anymore. Our taxes are paying for public school systems. Should we have a say in it? The educators say, no, we've got the degrees. You don't have a degree in this, do you? What do you know about education? Um, what was it recently? Um, something I was thinking about, I saw, ah, it comes to me here, that was taking place about education. Oh, no, well, I know what it was. It was... Uh, uh, it was uh, this is what it, it was the Ten Commandment thing in Louisiana, where they came out and said, you know what, we are going to pass a law here in our state legislature to post the Ten Commandments, and so it's getting a lot of flack from people, right? And it got flack from the View people, right, um, who you know, represent a lot of liberal people. And what's your name on there? Um, uh, what's your name? Um, Joy Baker. No, not Joy Baker, the, the black lady. Whoopi Goldberg. Yeah, Whoopi Goldberg. What's with the hair? What's with the socks? I don't get it. Weird, man. But anyway, um, that, so Whoopi Goldberg goes on on a rant, you know, about this thing, saying, you know, we don't want you forcing your beliefs on our children. I'm thinking, you force your beliefs on our children? That's what the, that's what the pride and the LGBT stuff is going on in the public schools is about. I mean, our tax, our tax money goes to pay for that junk that I don't want my kids and grandkids or anybody else's to be taught that. And many Americans don't want that stuff in the public school system. So they are forcing this stuff on us. And she gets up there representing liberals and saying, we don't want you forcing the Bible morality on us. You know, don't commit adultery. Don't commit murder. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't cheat. Don't force that on us. I mean, what's wrong with that? Somebody like somebody apparently is a liar, an adulterer, covetous, a cheater, a killer, a murderer, whatever else it might be. What's what's in the Ten Commandments that you can't post them? Well, you're preaching religion. No, it's not. It's a display. It doesn't say a thing. It doesn't speak. It doesn't move. It doesn't reach out and grab you. It's a piece of paper. On a wall. Right. And if you object to that, we object to all your pride crap right. on the walls in our public schools. Amen? I don't want my tax money going to that. So when she says, you're forcing, she's a liar, and all the rest of the liberals are a bunch of liars as well. Uh, so, knowledge without character. They have a lot of knowledge, but they have no character. Um, so, here's what Noah Webster said again. The Christian religion is the most important and one of the first things in which all children under a free government ought to be instructed. No truth is more evident to my mind than that the Christian religion must be the basis of any government intended to secure the rights and privileges of a free people. Christianity brings about freedom. Uh, Benjamin Rush, another founding father, said this, The only means of establishing and of perpetuating our republican forms of government is the universal education of our youth and the principles of 
of Christianity by means of the Bible. For this divine book, above all others, favors respect for just laws. Without religion, I believe that learning does real mischief to the morals and principles of mankind. That's the founding fathers. He would say, well, they, that wasn't a Christian nation. They weren't founded by Christianity, upon Christianity by Christians. Well, these guys sure sound like Christians to me. Right. Um, another thing that brings about the decline of America is business without integrity. Integrity speaks of uprightness and honesty and goodness. Business without integrity. Uh, 1 Timothy 6.10 says the love of money is the root of all evil. Right. It's the root of all evil. All evil, not just, that's, it doesn't say all sin. It says all evil. All the bad things and all the wicked and evil things in this world, I think of industries and corporations and things like that and governments. The love of money is the root of all evil. Anything for a buck is the motto for many people because it's all about the money, amen? Uh, the Bible says that in the last days, people will be truce breakers. They'll be covenant breakers. Uh, today, contracts, agreements, covenants mean almost nothing to people. Uh, people will lie, they'll cheat, they'll steal, uh, they'll kill to get what they want. And uh, the rich are sometimes some of the most ruthless people on the planet. Um, a man's word is no longer his bond. Used to, you could just, uh, you could, you could uh, uh, make a deal with a handshake. I, re I heard, uh, heard Jerry Lewis, a comedian from, you know, the 50s and 60s, uh, say this. He said, and he was like a big star in his time, right? He said this, he said, he said, I used to, my whole career, Make a bargain and a deal with anybody in the movie business with a handshake. We make a handshake and we make a million, you know, multi million dollar movie, you know, but on a handshake. And he said, in the 60s, it got to where you couldn't do that anymore. You had to sign a contract. And he said, I got to the place where I just kind of started dropping out because I don't want to deal with a bunch of dishonest people. I can't, if you can't shake my hand and your word be your bond, I don't want to do business with you if I sign anything or not. Um, so business without integrity brings down a nation. Um, and they do that because they break their word, they break their covenant, they break the agreement, the contract. Why? Because they have no principles, no morals, no convictions, and um, they have no character. Uh, many are ruled by profit rather than principle. Let me say this, just, this also includes, by the way, Christian businessmen, too, who sell out their testimony for money. Um, they'll sell liquor in their stores and dirty magazines because it's good for business. Uh, some Christians will move their membership to a larger church so they can have more business contacts. They'll forsake a good Bible preaching church to go to a larger church that takes a weak stand on things just simply because, hey, they'll leave a Baptist church and go join a Presbyterian church because there's richer people there. More contacts, business contacts. Um, God warns those who want to make it rich and hit the big time in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And look what Paul writes here. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 9, starting here. Um, this is uh, where he says that uh, the love of money is the root of all evil. He says this in verse number uh, 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that will be rich, that is those who will to be rich. They just, I'm going to be rich. I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to be a billionaire. I'm going to follow this and pursue this. But he says here, they that will be rich, what do they do? They fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. They've erred from the faith. Why? Because they put money and business over the things of God. Um, Charlie Reese used to write for the San Diego uh, newspaper. I think he's dead now, but he had a lot of good things to say. He wrote this probably in the 90s, I believe. When the elite who run a country have good morals and high standards, then you have a good country. If the elite become corrupt, you have a corrupt country. The vulgarity, profanity, and violence you see in entertainment are there only because those individuals occupying the positions of power in the entertainment industry said yes. 
If they said no, those things would disappear from the screens and the magazine racks tomorrow. But it's about the money. Business is good, but you've got to have integrity. Uh, back um, 20 years ago or so, uh, Mike Tyson needed some money. He was broke. So he wanted, he wanted to make $50 million. So he signed on to fight, uh, I think, Holyfield. Here in Memphis. Remember that? Yeah. In Memphis. And by the way, I called the fight. Holyfield in the fifth with a technical knockout. I told everybody about that. I said, if I had a bet, I would make some money. How'd you know that? I didn't know that. I just took a wild guess. But I thought so. I got it right. But anyway, um, Mike Tyson was under some uh, uh, criticism then because of, you know, allegedly uh, being charged with rape. Uh, whether that was true or not, I don't know. But in any case, he was under a cloud of that kind of thing. And he just, I, I, think, was, I think he just got out of prison maybe uh, not long before that or whatever. But he needed to make some money. And so... Um, he signed on to this, and Memphis signed on to having him come, in spite of any, you know, criticism of it. Uh, one of our, um, um, what, this, is what, this is what somebody, oh, this is what uh, one of our senators said from Tennessee. Mike Tyson is an industry, like Michael Jackson and Michael Jordan. We didn't want to have any talk about morality. We just wanted to have a fight because it's going to bring in money. That's all they wanted. So the city raked in $25 million, and that was worth it to them. And no matter what your opinion of him, of him was at the time, they dismissed the morality argument for anything. Uh, I believe it was J.C. Penney who, when he was a boy, worked for a man who taught him to cheat his customers by using a false weight and charging them more <coughs> and selling them less. He thought it was good business, and the man was teaching him right. And one day at, at the family supper... He told his family, and his dad was a businessman too, about what this guy taught him, what he was doing, how he was cheating and ripping off these people, making money. And his dad rebuked him. And he saw the error of his ways. And the rest of his life, I hear he paid 10% of his tithe to his church, by the way. Uh, business without integrity. God will bless your business if you have integrity. The devil will bless your business without integrity. Somebody said, well, God's blessing my business. Well, not if you're selling liquor. God's blessing my business, not if you're promoting illicit sex to the, by the magazines you sell. God ain't blessing them. The devil's blessing them. But God can bless you if you do right. Um, for time's sake here, well, I'll just mention this. Science without humanity brings about the decay of a nation. Uh, the Bible talks about science, falsely so-called. The Bible's not against science, but it's against pseudoscience. The Bible's not against science, but it's against junk science. Right. The Bible's not against science, but it's against... Science, this says it's science, but it's only so-called science, as the Bible calls it. Uh, the biggest lie that's done the most damage to our society is probably uh, the teaching of evolution in our schools. I believe that's probably the worst thing, because it simply denies Genesis 1-1 and the creation and the creator. Um, Nazi Germany was steeped in evolutionary teaching and believe that might makes right because of the Darwinian theory of the survival of the fittest. Nazi Germany used the science of Darwinism to dehumanize and destroy millions of human beings and allowed them to refer to people they didn't like as vermin. Um, today the abortion movement dehumanizes babies in the womb, calls it a fetus, not a child. And that accounts for something like 50 million or more babies that have been murdered in their mother's womb since 1973. Um, Eric Harris was a murderer at the Columbine High School in Colorado back in the 90s. He wore a shirt that said this, natural selection. That's the shirt he wore. What did Jesus say? It was natural selection. And he said this. He said natural selection was the best thing that ever happened to the earth getting rid of all the stupid and weak organisms. So they shot down and killed 16 fellow students because they were stupid and weak organisms. And he was superior to them. That's why he did it, because of his mindset, what he was taught, his viewpoint. Well, so not everybody gets that, no, but, you know, enough of them get that stuff and get it in their head, and the devil uses that and creates a monster because of that. By the way, some of the most famous and influential scientists ever have been Christians 
who believe in creation and believe the Bible. Um, almost done here. Let me say this. Number six, what brings about the decline of a nation? Churches without evangelism. Churches without evangelism. Uh, the church has to evangelize, as one preacher said, or it will fossilize. A lot of churches are dying across the country, dying in this city. You know why? Because there's no evangelism. Uh, without evangelism, churches drive and they die out. Um, a revolution and a civil war was averted in England due to the preaching of John Wesley and the Methodist. They went about preaching in public and passing out gospel literature all over England, and that put a damper on a lot of the rebellious attitude in England, or it would have turned out like France. Um, America was spared from early ruin and prepared to fight for independence due to the preaching of Bible-believing churches in the 1740s and on, and it was called the Great Awakening. The prime directive for the church is evangelism. That's the prime directive. Uh, the churches in America got off track in the early 1900s when they changed the mission of the church from evangelism to humanitarianism, thus producing what's called the social gospel, where the issues of heaven and hell and salvation were replaced with fighting poverty and forming unions. They want to bring in the kingdom here. They want a utopia here. They want the golden age here. And you're not going to get it. You can't build, you're not going to build the kingdom here. You need the gospel now. And like I said, there's nothing wrong with people caring for those kind of issues and doing something about it, more power to them. I'm glad you're doing it. That way we can just preach the gospel. Because you're taking care of that business. And we'll send them to you if somebody needs some help. Anyway, and then finally, let me say this worship without sacrifice. Worship without sacrifice brings down a nation. America was built by sacrifice. We saw that when we read earlier that the founding fathers, when they signed uh, uh, that document, said, you know, we, we pledge our, our lives and our sacred honor and our fortunes for this cause. Um, America was built by sacrifice. Uh, we enjoy the freedoms we have and the blessings of God in our nation now because of the sacrifices of those who went before us, the founding fathers and even the, and, and the particular, let's say, the, the soldiers of World War II literally saved the world. Yeah. Um, why? Because they had sacrificed. They sacrificed. Look at Romans chapter 12. We're going to close with Romans chapter 12. Look at Romans 12. This is a verse that every Christian should be familiar with and ought to really have memorized. Romans chapter 12. This ought to be a verse that a Christian looks to and thinks of and meditates upon his entire Christian life. Look what he says here. Romans 12, verse number 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living what? Sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. But he says there to Christian people, I want you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice to the Lord. Um, let me ask you this. What legacy are you and I going to leave our children and our grandchildren? Uh, we're witnessing the coming of age of the first and second generations of people who've been raised without prayer and Bible in the public schools. A secular, secular public schools. There's Christians in those schools. There are Christians in there that do witness, thank God for them, but the National Education Association is opposed to that. They want to promote all the wickedness the Bible's against, and they don't want the Ten Commandments displayed in their schools. Uh, why? Because they're biased and they're prejudiced. That's why. Um, let me say this. It only takes one generation to change a society. And the question is, are we willing to pray, to give, to attend, to witness in order to help this next generation come out right? And are you willing to yield to God and be what Paul asked and beseech you to be, and that is a living sacrifice to God? Are you alive today? Then you need to be a living sacrifice to God. You know what? There is no... The Bible said in one place that there is no, uh, no discharge in this war. Ecclesiastes, there's no discharge in this war. 
You're not discharged from duty until you're dead. Right. You fight until you're dead. That's what you do in the army. That's what you do in the military. You fight until you're dead. You know what you do in the Christian life? You fight, you serve until you are dead. How many here, how many here are dead today? Then you need to be a living sacrifice and you need to be serving God. Amen? You can't, you can't forget that. You can't quit on God. You can't forget God. Uh, you can't just uh, put him on the shelf. I take it back. You can if you want to. But you'll give an account of Jesus to Christ for your laziness and lack of character and lack of devotion and duty to God. He wants a living sacrifice. That's what he wants. He wants you to present your body to him as one. Uh, many people could present their lot there. You know, you presented your body as a living sacrifice today in one sense. You're here for a public worship service. Where's everybody else at? They might be sick, they might be in the hospital, they might be in jail, right? But you know what? If you're healthy, if you're a healthy, able-bodied American, you ought to be in church every time that you can be in church on Sunday. Why? To worship God. So I just can't do that. I mean, you mean you can't sacrifice a Sunday for the ball game? You can't sacrifice Sunday for the lake? You can't sacrifice Sunday? Now I know you go on vacation, you do some things a couple times a year. You might miss a Sunday church service here and there because of that. But when you're able-bodied and in the area, this is the most important place to be. And if it's not to you, then you don't have the right attitude. You need to get right with God. Simple as that. If I don't have that attitude, I need to get right with God. Amen? So, living sacrifice. So, we're talking about the, the decline of America. And it is declining. And uh, I don't know if we have anybody that can save America or not, but only Jesus can do that, but we can pray that God will give us some leaders with character and integrity that will do the right thing. That's what we need. So, by the grace of God, maybe we'll get there. Hopefully. All right, till that time, no matter what happens, we need to serve God. Amen? Amen. In 2024, guess what? 2024, we can still go down on a public street, pass out tracts, and preach the Bible, and not get arrested and thrown in jail. You know, because we have a religious freedom in America. We need to use that freedom, amen, while we have it. Let's stand for a word of prayer while Brother Matt comes and plays a song of invitation. Father in heaven, we do thank you for this day and for your blessings. We thank you, God, for the opportunity that we do have to have religious freedom in this country to this day, that we can come to church, the church of our choice, and, Lord, worship you and serve you and fellowship with other believers. We pray, God, that you'll help us, Lord, not to take this for granted. And help us, Lord, to realize that there is a lost and dying world out there that needs the gospel and that, Father, we're responsible to them to get it to them. Father, we pray that you'll bless uh, the, this nation. We pray that this nation would turn back to you. We take, pray this nation would do works meet for repentance. We do, we do pray that the leadership in our country, Father, that uh, many of them that are Christians would take a stand for you. And for those that aren't Christian, that God, you convict their hearts of their need of Christ and forgiveness and salvation. They would get saved and let it be known. And they would, uh, Lord, uh, order their lives and their careers and their politics and all these things that affect us according to the Scriptures. Father, we pray, God, that you would uh, help us now, Lord, and Father, help us to be uh, a people that exalts you and wants to do right and serve you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. While he plays, if you need to come and pray, this altar is open. Whatever the need might be, but we want to pray for our nation, pray for our leaders, pray that the gospel will get to those who need it, and those who need to be saved will get saved, genuinely saved. the gospel. Maybe God might put someone across your path that you can explain it to them. And you can lead them to Christ. Or maybe they're a Christian who's not been taught well. Maybe you could do what the Bible says and maybe you could teach them the way of God more perfectly. Help them get more focus on what their faith is about and what they ought to believe. And how it ought to affect how we live. We'll pray for a little bit. Anyone comes to the altar, we'll dismiss here in a minute.